Could That's come from yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. But I also think, I think one of the key things in pharma and, and anywhere else in innovation is necessity is the mother of um, invention, they say. And in many areas, when you are struggling, you're amazed like how many ideas, mm -hmm. uh, like many of the innovations that happen in India does not get written up in an HBR mm -hmm. uh, business article. But I can tell you when I go there and I actually think about how communities organize their healthcare and how mm -hmm. they've pooled uh, their risks. It is amazing that I can actually take those lessons and go to the humanas and the ethnos of the world and say, if this village in India could do that with no IT, no infrastructure, mm -hmm. no, and they've been able to create a concept that, how can you transform mm -hmm. that? to the larger organizations. Having said that, I think, um, you know, we tend to think all of the ideas come from, you know, a central place, which is usually the Western world, which is, um, and pharma tended to have that. Pharma tended to think that the most cutting edge research and the best people were all in their labs. So now these people have actually a lot more say at the table as to what gets innovated and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that has changed that equation in pharma. Yeah, let me add two observations. It's if you look at Pfizer and Merck, who are the giants, right, of the 90s and whatnot, it's fascinating, right? Merck's major R&D establishment is Rawway. All of the drugs came out of the satellite in West Point and in Merck Frost. Yeah. If you look at Pfizer, huge infrastructure at Groton, most of them came out of Sandwich, the small union. Okay. So we all know cultures of innovation, you can get too large, right? The other thing which we haven't mentioned is the importance of celebrating what we call noble failure. Mm -hmm. If you're innovating, if, if, if your experiment hasn't failed, you haven't had a failed experiment, you're not trying hard enough to be creative. But that means as well as celebrating the great success, we have a regular session which we call noble failures. <laughs> All right, and we celebrate noble failures, not stupid failures but noble failures, okay? And that you, have, you think about the, how profound that is in your organization. People then are not afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. They're not afraid to say, I think differently, okay? And you have a, a leadership that says, go for it, you know, all right? And, you know, Paul Simon said, I gotta write the nine bad songs to write the good 10 song. <laughs> so what about Amgen's model? And I don't, I don't know if this was a, a, a short-term experiment where they had competing teams within the company. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting to go in and visit as a sales rep. So I would talk to all the groups. And they were so worried that I was going to be the one spreading the ideas from team to team. And the culture that created was horrific. It was unbelievable. They even gave stock out to people who had the winning ideas. And they, they were directly competing within the company. And to me, that was probably the worst thing I ever witnessed and from I don't human point of view, yes from and from a team uh, internal teams just it the human nature piece that of was that Microsoft's was Microsoft's old culture stack ranking exactly and bidding yes people against exactly one another. exactly oh. and so it, it is interesting that you always have to wrap the human nature into how you set up teams and how you really foment uh, the creativity and the sharing and the cooperation and I kind of I don't want to bring a sexist thing into this, but I, I feel like it's more of a female way of, of operating, that we tend to be more the gatherers of information, where we, we're constantly wanting to talk to other people and share ideas, and uh, versus the hunters who go in and just they're looking for the one idea and they're going to pull out what they need. And I, I have to believe that having more women in organizations at the top, where we, we let other ideas around cultures and how we come up with ideas and how we share information with each other. Judy Lewent probably agrees with that. So. I don't know who she is. But. She's the CFO. CFO from her. Yeah. Okay, yes. So, it, I, I, and <laughs> I feel like... That would not the, be an accurate characterization of Judy. <laughs> right, but I just, I had to bring it up because I feel like there's, there's opportunity in yeah. pharma also to be a little more inclusive of other ideas and other ways of looking at problems and how we solve problems. Yeah, it's clearly a gender thing and clearly look, I mean, reflected cultural approaches. Exactly. You know, well, geographical that, that approaches. Steve made it, I just want to resonate off what you said. The most important thing that you just uh, hit on is the inclusivity of mm -hmm. that, right? The idea that failure celebrated by anyone and everyone who's done it is, is a much harder thing to, to sort of bring forward because it's that, that ability to participate in that kind of way that's so often lacking, right? And so finding, finding ways to get that more front and center and how we do what we do is got And as women, we are, we don't, we're not entitled to fail nearly yeah, as much. Exactly. We can't, it, it's, yeah. we have to cover it up or we have to 
be yeah. fearful of it, we're not allowed to celebrate it quite as much, I don't think. Isn't that just prevalent in a large organizational structure, getting away from just calling it pharma, but any large organization? I mean, mm -hmm. the idea that as you progress through your career and you're, you know, 15 years in the industry, people are afraid of diverting and then failing mm -hmm. because it has a direct career impact. Yeah. It's just, mm -hmm. That's just human nature. So it's a wonderful article um, in the Times last August by David Brooks. And in it, he talks about the difference between a career and a vocation. Mm -hmm. And a vocation being something you're called to and that which you take responsibility for publicly. Whereas career is something you are careful not to screw up mm -hmm. and you make sure you hide your failure, all right? And that I think in certain of these industry, and I'll speak from biotech because I've been in it since the early 1980s, which was pretty many in the beginning, it was a vocation, all right? It was a calling, mm -hmm. all right? And as I have young people coming to work to me and they'll say, you know, uh, is this good for my career? What do you think? And it's like, <laughs> You know, is it important to you? Do you care about it? Is it important to the world? All right. And so, absolutely. And you see, you see this in mergers and acquisitions, right? It's like people are saying, all right, you know this within licensing a product. Don't lend license a product if there's going to be a readout soon. <laughs> right? Egg on the face, right? Or um, uh, I don't want it to mature quickly enough. I hope to have moved on before. You know, I can always claim credit in the rearview mirror, but I can disclaim it otherwise. People don't make long-term decisions. They don't make decisions for the long-term value creation. And you have to remember the value creation is the sum of de novo value created, less value destroyed. People are worried about their careers, spend more time worrying about being perceived for destroying value, okay, than they do taking the risk of creating de novo this value. This is the problem with a dis in an industry being disrupted. You know, in behavioral economics, behavioral finance, one of the most important insights that you come away with is the notion of a sunk cost. You know, uh, uh, there are a lot of people for completely understandable psychosocial reasons and accounting reasons, it's a sunk cost is perceived as an investment. You don't want to have to write down the investment on your, your watch. And, and uh, you know, I think as I look at, I, don't, I claim, no great expertise into to pharma, but I have some knowledge of what's going on in healthcare and devices mm -hmm. more broadly. And these are, in, I, I think these industries for completely understandable reasons and the people who lead them for completely understandable reasons have huge investments in their way of doing these, these well, things. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, going to get the, they're going to get the crap kicked out of them by disruptors. Well, I wonder mm -hmm. if it's not just, because uh, you mentioned the culture of leadership, that it's okay to make mistakes, but actually the, even in terms of economics, there's, a, there's an author of, uh, of a book on the subject of innovation and economics that says, look, take, say, 50 people that report into someone and there's a risk associated with each of their programs. How many of the individuals would take the shot, right? So each, right. Which, which project leader would take the shot if there's a 50% chance of failing? And it, as the CEO, knowing that 50, 50 people taking that shot is going to result in X value, That's right. if you ask the question of which of the 50 are going to do the, take the shot, they're all going to say no, because there's right. a chance of failing. So as a CEO, you want them all to take the shot, but each of them individually is, is, is incentivized to not take the shot. Two nuances, that's though, culture. On that the two nuances on that one is, I think if you're taking the same shot that everybody else mm -hmm. took, everybody would do that. Yes. Because there's less risk of somebody coming up to you and saying, yeah, you tried your best, but you failed. Mm -hmm. I think the fundamental thing that prevents us from doing something different is to let go of something that, is, that you're doing today. Mm -hmm. Um, and then doing something different involves that risk that we all articulated. But it, again, I, I always connect the organization, the personal, uh, you know, because I always think we're not that different from an organizational perspective and the human individual perspective. And we're an organization right now, we're not like as big as j and or we're not as rich with lots of, we're very focused. But the question that really drives innovation within our company is, what the hell do we have to lose? Well, you know, it's a, you know, if you look at early stage drug discovery, if you do the classic business tool of the NPV or DCF analysis and the IRR, it always comes out negative. Right. Yep. And it's a function of the time and the possibility of success, right? And so if you have classically trained business people, they will never invest in R&D. They'll talk about early R&D being value destructive. Right? In, in and let me finish. 
but to me, the proper analysis uh, is what I call the relative upside. If we do this, what can it mean to us? Relative downside, right? early stage stuff. It's not a very, it's not a very expensive. It's not going to kill you Correct. if you're substantial. Yep. And the other is, what if we don't? Yep. Mm -hmm. What if we don't? And that comes to someone's going to come along and clean your clock if you don't. <laughs> okay. The only comment I would add is NPV has a function. Uh, it serves a certain function in terms of the analysis. But where I think the flaw is that you assume a certain baseline. Well, you, you assume, assume you know a certain future. You know, so you assume yeah. that the so things you believe are true. It's like saying, I will not take <laughs> this job, for example, in my own <laughs> life. Right? You're absolutely right. I won't take this job because it pays me less. That assumes that my current job and my current income stream is yeah. absolutely the same. <laughs> well, you see, there's a deeper human thing going on. I think it ties, again, people yeah. hiding behind analytics, yeah. all right, in terms yeah. of career, and also a fundamental need from human need to escape the responsibility for judgment. Right? Yes. And so you, in, you put in a false precision, okay? Mm -hmm. As if that could decide, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, very early on in, you know, in the ethics, Aristotle says the nature of the under knowledge is different and appropriate to the subject matter. So what you seek in mathematics is very different than what you seek yeah, in ethics right. or practical wisdom versus theoretical wisdom, you know, so. But in the sciences, I think the Disraeli's quote, I, and I don't know if he came up with it, but it's much easier to be critical than to be right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we, I, yeah. I think we fall back on that all the, and in the sciences especially, that is something that just rings loud.